Welcome to the Nutramedical Report live for Tuesday, and uh, this is the 10th of July, 2012. We have a, a remarkable author and researcher, Chris Putnam, who researched along with Tom Horn and have published this new book now called Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope. Uh, and how can they obtain the book, uh, Chris Putnam? Uh, the book is available at Amazon.com. It's also available at, at Barnes and Noble stores. Um, but uh, you know, one thing we can talk about is some of the findings that Tom and I uncovered in the process of the research are so shocking that we wanted to provide some of the source material that we uncovered. So we exactly. have a website. If you order the book from www.prophecyofthepopes.com. We actually provide a, a supplementary data DVD with over 20,000 pages of source documents that, that we footnote in the book. Now, exactly. Now, uh, when I published my books with Prophecy Club 13 years ago, Clay, uh, Clay and Iron and Abortion Arm, again, one of the things that I stated was that the final religious system would be an amalgamation of all the so-called Abrahamic religions, the great apostasy, in other words. And, in fact, uh, this was prophesied in the, I think, it was at 1039, uh, by uh, a Greek, uh, sorry, or, or by an Irish archbishop, um, and uh, I guess his name was Malachi, and he later became sainted by the Catholic Church. But uh, it's a very interesting prophecy because he's actually named and accurately named every single pope, and says that the current pope is the second to the last. And of course, uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth is a very old pope. He's been involved with a lot of the quote uh, process to try to bring together. The Greek, Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Church of England, and even to have dialogue with Islam and Sabbatay and Judaism to bring them under one umbrella, a super-religion in a sense. Uh, and uh, this final pope, Pope uh, Petrus Romanus, is a very interesting prophecy because the fact is that when you have a batting average as high as this, these prophecies have been, it far exceeds any other historical prophecy almost in any public domain. The uh, prophecies of... Uh, the line of popes quite amazing isn't it well you know it, it really is um it's it's kind of a, a unique prophecy um I, i'm a protestant and you know when i started this investigation i didn't really buy into the the saint malachi prophecy and um you know I, i'm still not a hundred percent I'm still somewhat skeptical. I have kind of a wait-and-see attitude, but, you know, when I really investigated and dug in, I tried to debunk it. I took a pretty skeptical methodology, and, you know, I discussed that in the book, but, you know, I really could not debunk it. Um, well, it, we know that there are people, there are, there are believers, and I say this all the time, there's believers that have, have and are in the Catholic Church and every other, quote, Christian denomination, even with all the baggage and problems and issues, uh, Archbishop Mal Malachi was actually one of the important uh, Irish archbishops that kept the gospel and the Bible when uh, England was being attacked and taken over by Anglo-Saxons and Jutes and re-evangelized hundreds of years later. The followers later on that came to the British Isles to evangelize were Irish, and they were, the, in a sense, the followers and the descendants of the teachings of Malachi and the keepers of the book, in a sense, in Ireland. And even in Europe, a lot of Europe was conquered by the, the if you want to call it the Vandals, the, the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths, and they were all pagan, uh, if you call it, invading tribes that uh, descended on the on the kingdoms that were Christian throughout Europe and England. Yeah, he was known as a, a moral reformer. I mean, right there at the 12th century uh, is the time where really the, the Catholic Church was coming out of the, the darkest pit of the, of the Dark Ages. And, you know, he was known as a moral reformer, and he, he, um, he really tried... To, to straighten things out, and he actually he went on a pilgrimage to Rome to see the Pope. He had set up two new districts in uh, Armagh, Ireland, is where he was from, and so right. he goes, goes on this arduous journey, and he had to go up across Europe to avoid the mountains, and then back down into Italy. And the way the legend goes is that that he had an audience with the Pope, and um, it didn't go exactly as the way he he he, he kind of wanted to retire and go. Um, to Bernard's Abbey and hang out at the monastery, but that didn't happen. He actually got uh, promoted, and he was made the uh, papal legate for all of Ireland, so he actually got more responsibility instead of less. And, you know, the people that, that comment on the history of this thing say that as he journeyed from Rome, 
there's a Janicom Hill right outside of Rome. He had a vision. And it's hard to, to pin down exactly how this works, but he had a vision of 112 popes right up to the second advent to the tribulation period. And, uh, now, you know, he, these, these uh, prophecies came in these like little Latin phrases, and they're, some of them are kind of vague and nebulous. It's like cross of Romulus, unsatiable beast, um, religion depopulated, uh, glory of the olive. And, you know, at first glance, they're, they're kind of vague, like I said. And so what he did is he has, you have this list, and they're all in a sequence, these Latin phrases, and they're, they're, they're supposed to match something about the Pope. And then what we see in the early parts of the prophecy is a lot of them seem to describe the coat of arms. Um, it's called heraldry. is like an art and science in, in Roman Catholicism. You know, the ancient people really put a lot of value on your coat of arms and your family. And so many of these little Latin phrases are, are, are kind of astonishing hits for the coat of arms in the early part of the prophecy. Now, the thing that's somewhat dubious, and you'll find a lot of scholars who write about this thing will call it a forgery, because there's really not a copy of it that we can lay our hands on and, and prove until 1595. So you, you literally have a gap between when it was allegedly given in 1139 and 1595, so like over 400 years, no one really knows where this thing is. And, and you know, a lot of commentators say it was locked away in some dusty vault in the Vatican. Um, now, in my research, I, I uncovered that there really do seem to be some people mentioning it around 1570 or something like that. So there yeah, there was a publication about 400 about years. In, in various yeah. letters. So, you know, we can tell that it existed then. Now, what I did, just to kind of test this thing, is instead of looking at the prophecies before the date of publication, you can really examine the ones after the, we know that it's in print. And, and that way, there's really no you know, argument that it was prophecy after the event. And, and that's the argument that most of the skeptics will lay forth. And I think there is something to that. It, it does appear that maybe someone modified part of the earlier portion of the prophecy. But um, the part after 1595, you can't explain away as prophecy after the event because that's not even controversial. Everyone is, is fully aware that this book was published yeah. and in wide circulation by 1595. Yeah. So there's quite a few very astonishing yeah. um, matches that yeah, there's two. after the publication date. If you think about logically, there's two ways of this occurring. Number one, it was a real prophecy. And number two, it was almost a roadmap uh, for a, if you want to call it the outworking to make certain that the prophecies were followed. In other words, it was almost like a road map. Uh, it, has anybody written to suggest that maybe this is a road map for them to manipulate events so that the prophecy would be coming true? Well, you know, I, I think that there's something to that, and I came to that conclusion in a few instances because there are some of them where it really looks like the Pope tried to make it match like he 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 would do something like well for instance one example would be our current pope uh pope benedict the 16th now the the latin phrase for his pontificate is glory of the olive and for for the reason that the the um the benedictine order has always had an olive branch as its symbol so for you know the last few decades many people who follow this prophecy were expecting a benedictine monk to be elected Pope. Now, Cardinal Ratzinger is not a Benedictine. So when he first got elected, um, no one, had, you know, they thought maybe the prophecy had failed. But then he picked his own papal name to be Benedict. And that really seems like, you know, he was trying to fulfill this thing almost. Yeah, in other words, he's like he's trying to fulfill the prophetic uh, situation by actually picking the name Benedict. Yeah. Indeed, but what, the thing that's, that's more astounding, though, as far as the prophecy goes, is there are some examples that seem to be beyond human control. Keep, keep that thought. Will... Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and 
One thing we've been seeing is the end time is the so-called collapse of Europe, which is imminent, was actually going to precede the Federation of Europe. We know that one of the end time prophecies was the rise of a superpower in Europe. Uh, the By the way, Europe, most people aren't aware of this, but the Federal Reserve, five out of the six uh, Key banks, which are basically we call the chairman of the bank, and the head uh, chairman and woman of the bank is actually key Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, of our quote Fed Reserve. The idea is they want to have a G20 world currency, which will, in a sense, be primarily European and American, with the Fed Reserve printing as much money as possible to loan to the Central Europe Central Bank. They want an FDIC of Europe, and a federated Europe is virtually almost a certainty by this fall. Uh, that means the rise of a empire. We also have a brewing war in the Middle East with Syria and Iran at the knife's edge there with Kofi Annan zipping around and even Assad agreeing to the six-point plan. This means a peace treaty which is going to break out and part of that peace treaty will have to be a religious, if you want to call it detente, between Islam, Judaism, uh, Christianity of its various sects including Armenian Christianity, which has always had a long-term presence in the Middle East. And uh, all these things are happening in our day with a pope who's very old and very soon to be replaced by a new pope, probably in the next couple of years. So all of this is happening at a time where we can see the fulfillment of these, literally almost like as you approach the dock and the, and the mist is lifting, you can see the, the shapes of the buildings on the dock. You can see all the people. You can actually see the events unfolding exactly like the prophecies in the Bible. So, Chris, tell us more about this uh, Ten Nation European Union newspaper article that you've posted up on your site, uh, uh, logosapologia.org, which I'll post up as well. Well, certainly. Um, you know, Bible prophecy scholars have been uh, speculating for, for decades now that there would be a revived Roman Empire. Uh, comprising of, of ten nations, and um, you know you can go back and look in the the 1960s and, and see uh, commentaries by John Valbrude, who was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. Even Hal Lindsey's book, The Great, Late Great Planet Earth, spoke of a revived Roman Empire. And the reason for that is in Daniel chapter seven, there's a prophecy about a beast, and, it, and it, it pretty transparently predicts the first rise of the Roman Empire. But then, you know, it kind of harkens to the future, and it says, out of these ten horns, a kingdom of ten kings will arise, and another shall arise after them. And it goes on and it talks about the little horn, which is the Antichrist. So, in the book of Daniel, a book that's composed in the 6th century B.C., it's talking about a revived kingdom a revived Roman Empire. Um, and in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 1, talks about a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems or crowns on the horns. So this led scholars to, to, to think that the Roman Empire would be revived in a ten-nation confederacy. Well, quite astonishingly, just um, in June, June 20th, a German website and a German uh, magazine and newspaper, I suppose, uh, reported that 10 EU foreign ministers got together to uh, transform the European Union into a federation along the lines of the United States. Um, this really sounds a lot like the kind of things that Hal Lindsey and people like John Ralbrood were, were writing about 20, 30 years ago. Um, I don't quite know if, if this is really the fulfillment of it, but it surely yeah. is quite intriguing. It is, and uh, one of the other fulfillments that has been uh, looked at for years is the 1973 article in the Journal of Foreign Affairs by the Council on Foreign Relations that uh, broke the earth into ten trade zones, with America being trade zone three, which includes Canada, the United States, and Mexico. North America is zone three. So uh, it could be... Uh, we, we see this forming, though. We know that there's so many signs in the Bible that tells us there will be a rise of the Roman Empire. And remember, it talks about the the legs of iron and the feet of clay and iron, that there are two legs, which is the eastern leg and the western leg. The, the eastern leg, which, of course, is Constantinople and the eastern empire of Turkey, which would be in the eastern empire uh, that would rise uh, from the eastern leg of Rome. And that's happened with NATO. Turkey is, is now part of the uh, European Union. And, of course, it also means in the sphere of influence of Turkey, we have other nations there trying to get peace with them, including the nation of Russia. Russia is trying to get involved with trade. Its currency is no longer is not uh, convertible except through the dollar. Uh, it is basically a single economy based on oil and, and uh, 
We have the rising empire of China, which is totally dependent on being able to sell its goods to Europe and the West. Uh, so this, I believe, is a, a, a very clear sign that we're in the end times. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. In the end, not the end of the world, but the end of the age as we know it, because they're getting ready to collapse by design the world economy and to build this new empire. And, of course, out of the ashes of the collapse of Europe will come a federated Europe, and that's going to happen probably in the next six months to a year. I suspect it might. Now, let's get back to um, where I kind of left everybody dangling. We were talking about this this 900-year-old Catholic prophecy. Um, we definitely have a copy of it you know, in print in 1595. Now, I was going to tell your listeners about one of the one of the more intriguing fulfillments that's happened in the 20th century. This is the one, you know, I was pretty skeptical about this thing. When I saw this one, I really stood up and took notice. Now, the the Latin motto that fell for the the papacy of Benedict the 15th was religio depopulata. Now, that just means in English religion depopulated. Now, in the sequence, this pope was put from 1914 to 1922. Now, the thing that makes this motto particularly interesting to me is that it's not vague. It makes a risky prediction. You know, when a scientist wants to check a hypothesis, he makes a risky prediction, and then he designs an experiment and tries to falsify it. Now, if it doesn't falsify, he considers it a confirmation. So when you have a prediction like religion depopulated, this is something that is kind of going out on the edge, is taking a chance. I mean, this thing could have easily been falsified if the church had just kind of stayed the same or if it had grown a little bit or something like that. This, this would be a false prophecy. But what happened between this period of time, from 1914 to 1922, was probably the most devastating losses that the church ever took. You had World War I, um, which was devastating to Europe, definitely devastating to the Roman Catholic Church. But to add insult to injury, this was the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. I mean, scholars estimate that up to 200 million people left the church to join the Communist Party. Now, the ones that didn't leave, you have Stalin and Lenin specifically targeting religious leaders because they saw them as a threat to the state. Um, Stalin alone is credited with probably having 43 million people killed. So, you know, this is the time that the church lost more people than any other time in history, and it's exactly what this prophecy predicted. Uh, you know, and like I said, it's uncontroversial that this thing's in print in 1595, and here we have it totally nailing events that happened in the early 20th century. Yeah, that really is remarkable. Now, uh, when you uh, co-authored this with Tom Horn, what were the most remarkable things you found that indicate how imminent this is in terms of your research? Well, you know, the thing that that jumps right out and, and you have to take notice of is the ending of this prophecy. This is really, the, you know, once you see that there are some good reasons to suspect it's a real prophecy. Well, we're at number 111 on the list of 112 posts. So the very next one, so here's the prediction. Now, this one is not... Keep that thought, we'll be right back. Welcome back, and uh, Chris Putnam, please continue your thought just uh, you started before the break. Okay, well, what, what I was about to, to, to deliver was this 112th prophecy. So just to be clear, we're at the one number 111 right now. Pope Benedict XVI, glory of the olive, was 111. The very next pope, here is the prediction. In the extreme persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will nourish the sheep in many tribulations. When they are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. The end. By nourishing the sheep, it means he's going to give some truth to the sheep. Uh, what's the story there? Or Because there's, there's also a prophecy that there's going to be a great apostasy right before this uh, end of the age, which basically means a form of ecumenism where they absorb uh, false doctrines, to the point where it doesn't even resemble Christianity and at the time of the end. Yeah, you know, I don't quite know how to take that reference to nourishing the sheep because, 
you know, what, what I see, you know, what stands out to me is that the church is persecuted. Uh, we have this final pope who is Petrus Romanus, and that's where the name of our book comes from, Peter the Roman. Right. Uh, so that's, and, but what I see right here is that Rome is destroyed. I mean, the city of Seven Hills is a very transparent reference to Rome. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia says that Rome is the city of Seven Hills. Right. So, and then you see that the dreadful judge will judge his people. So, I mean, I see tribulation, I see Rome destroyed. I see judgment. Um, I, you know, what we present an argument in our book that this character, Petrus Romanus, is the biblical false prophet predicted in Revelation chapter 13. But, you know, right off the bat, this little apocalyptic ending to the Malachi prophecy, it really matches uh, Revelation chapter 17, which is talking about mystery Babylon, the great harlot. Um, and, you know, this is what commentators have have been talking about for centuries is this apostate, end-time religious system. Many people would say a one-world religion, and I think that it's pretty obvious that the Vatican has been moving that way. Oh, yeah, the, well, the World Council decade. of Churches and, uh, and Vatican II and all of these other things, it's been obvious that that's been in, on the agenda for ages. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you look at the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 17, verse 9, it says, And here is a mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So the woman that rides the beast is this mystery Babylon, the great harlot. And it, it says right there in verse 9 that she sits on seven mountains. That's the city of seven hills. It's, it's a pretty right. transparent reference to Rome, but right. if that weren't enough, Chapter 17 ends, the last verse says that the woman that you saw is the great city that had dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, when we interpret the Bible, the, the way that we, you know, we should relegate our, our interpretation to what was the author's intention. Now, when John wrote Revelation to the, you know, the provinces of Asia Minor, this thing circulated as a letter to Ephesus and Thyatira and Laodicea and, and all the churches that he wrote letters to in the beginning. This was around 90 A.D. It was at the height of the Roman Empire. And there really just isn't any good argument that there was any other city that would have dominion over the kings of the earth other than Rome when he wrote this thing. So that's obviously what he intended us to believe. Yeah, um, but Rome still has dominion over the years. People should kind of look into the the fact of the black and white pope and the fact that the Rothschild and the world bankers are actually vassals of the Vatican. They should realize that uh, the Vatican still holds sway over the World Council of Churches and has been trying to put together a super religion for almost a century now that actually will absorb every religion on earth, including paganism and uh, snake worship and God knows what. Uh, it's been something that's been there, you know, in fact, they even said to the Greek Orthodox Church in, in, in Russia that as long as you uh, maintain the primacy of the Pope, you, we, we're, we're not sticklers on dogma. You can keep your dogma, just come and join us and be under the umbrella of the Vatican. Well, that, you know, that really seems to be the case. Um, Dave Hunt uh, made a video with his book called The Woman Rides the Beast that came out ten years ago or more. Um, and he showed scenes of a day of prayer in the documentary that John Paul II had. And he literally had Hindus, he had Satanists, he had um, voodoo priests from Africa, and they were all gathered at St. Peter's Square praying together. Um, you know, that <laughs> is, is more than an ecumenical movement. I mean, that, that was quite astounding to witness, but I think you can find articles about that on the on the internet, but um, it, was a, it was an incredible day of prayer. And this is the kind of pluralism that we see the Vatican embracing now. Um, they still want to assert their primacy over everyone, but they're willing to, to absorb all these uh, faiths that are absolutely contradictory. Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. Know, In other words, so you can take your dogma with you, but we're all under one religious umbrella is what they're trying to do. It does seem like it's more of a power play than it's about, than it's about truth, you know. Right. Uh, they they, they kind of give lip service to Christian theology, but when it comes down to uh, power, they're willing to compromise every time. Now, this is one of the reasons that, that Tom and I have asserted that it's a, a very high probability that this final pope could be the biblical false prophet. 
Um, in Revelation chapter 13, now a lot of people talk about the Antichrist, but I mean, this false prophet guy is, is somebody that doesn't get discussed much, but there's actually says in, in Revelation 13, verse 11, that I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spake like a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast, which would be the Antichrist, and causeth the earth and them which dwell within to worship the first beast. So here we have a religious leader, and it's described as horned like a lamb, yet spake like a dragon. Now I think that, you know, in apocalyptic symbolism, it, it's pretty clear to me that like a lamb is somebody, it's probably going to be seen as a Christian leader. You know, Jesus... Uh, John yeah. the Baptist said, the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, right? Um, so we have someone that l it looks like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. And the book of Revelation defines the dragon as Satan. So that's, that's uncontroversial. So I think what we're seeing is someone who is viewed by the world as a Christian leader, as the vicar of Christ, perhaps, yet he's doing the bidding of Satan and causing the world to worship the Antichrist. Yeah, right now we, for example, the uh, religious differences in the Mideast are about to inflame the world, not just to cut off the oil at the Strait of Hormuz, but to collapse the world economy and to bring us to the brink of a thermonuclear, biological, chemical, and scalar war that will end civilization and human life on the planet. Uh, and that is actually could happen literally at any day. It's not even, it's a, we know there's prophetic things that happen that have to happen first. There has to be a period of, I say, what I see coming is not an outbreak of a major war, but an outbreak of false peace. And that false peace will be led by a false peace leader that will be primarily religious leader that will bring together a dialectic between all these disparate Abrahamic religions, Islam, Christianity, and Greek Orthodoxy, and the Protestant religions under one umbrella to try to bring a, quote, a period of peace or a false peace. And that's coming very quickly, isn't it? But, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a prophet, and I, I don't claim to have any inside information well, I'm just other talking than about the I'm research just... that I'm doing. And, you know, I believe these, the Bible prophecies. I think that the Malachi well, I just think logically, if you, even is very if you just... suggestive of the timing. You know, yeah. I, I, you know I wouldn't, I'm not going to sell my house based on it, but I, I no. think that... Um, there's but good I, reasons to be paying very close attention because it does seem like we're right up against well, it. Just look at the, at the checklist we talked about earlier in the program. We have the collapse of Europe and heading up a federation, which is the resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. We have the right. rise of an apostate Christianity, which is the great apostasy, which is about to happen. We have the collapse of the world economy uh, imminent on the closure of the Strait of Hormuz and the cutting off the oil and a great war between Sunni and Shiite Islam waiting for the, the uh, Mahdi, the uh, mm. final, the Imam Mahdi. And all of these religions are all tied together to global peace that require a religious response tied to the global world order. Uh, all makes sense, doesn't it? it? It does seem to be falling in place. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting, hey. So yeah, I think that I think we're very close to it. Um, the way I think of it too is are we on a break right now? We are on a break. Yeah. natural Remarkable findings in terms of the number 2012, and these are not have nothing to do with Mayan prophecy. Several different sources. One uh, dealing with the 1260 uh, uh, prophecy year, year prophecy that goes back, uh, landing in 2012. Let's go through some of these because I think people should realize that God doesn't violate your logic as well. And when He gives something supernatural, I believe that everything. If you just kind of look at this from a very sober viewpoint, you can see. The collapse of the world economy heading toward a new federated Europe. The uh, closure of the Strait of Hormuz, which uh, if people listen to this program, they know I've talked about this for many years, that the Strait of Hormuz closure, technical or otherwise, is the, if you want to call it the firing, final firing shot that will bring both a peace treaty in the Middle East because Kofi Annan's six-point plan requires eventually that, uh, that there will be enough peace that the Jews will be able to set the... Uh, the stone which they've already placed there for the rebuilding of the Herodian temple and that's actually about to happen very soon 
probably within a matter of a couple of years, and whoever the next president is is the only one who has the scroll of Bush, researched by Tex Mars, that has the right to actually authorize the rebuilding of the Herodian Temple. That's likely to occur at the time of the next pope. So the Vatican has been buying up land around Jerusalem, has just taken over in the last months two major new uh, sites in Jerusalem. Uh, everything is moving forward is as planned, if you want to call it. Absolutely. Um, so let's go yeah. through these uh, 2012 uh, prophecies. How did they arrive on these dates, and, and who were they? Well, you know, that was one of the most astounding things to me. Uh, when Tom and I started working on this book, uh, I really did not have the year 2012 on my radar at all. In fact, I, I've been publicly critical about all the hysteria around the Mayan Yeah, so, so am I. It's, a, it's all foolishness, is basically. But we do know that there's <laughs> yeah, events I mean, going to happen, so. though. And, you know, I yeah. kind of even, I, I, I did a, a critique of the show Ancient Aliens on the History Channel where they kind of jumped on the 2012 bandwagon. So, you know, I've been publicly outspoken uh, critiquing it. But, um, you know, when I was researching this Malachi prophecy, I started, you know, finding books by uh, different Europeans. And one of the ones that I found uh, was a believer in the prophecy. He was a Jesuit priest. His name was Rene Thibault. He was a professor at the University of Namur in Belgium. Now, he wrote a book in French called The Mysterious Prophecy of the Popes. And uh, this thing was published in 1950, and Rene Thibault died the next year. Um, and so it's, it kind of went obscure. But I, I looked it up. I found it at a university about 50 miles away and dug up this book. Um, he mentions the year 2012 over 24 times in this book. It, the copyright on the book is 1951. Okay, he he predicts the arrival of the final pope in 2012 over and over again. Now he was kind of a mystic. He found all kinds of anagrams and encryption schemes within the Latin text of this prophecy. He took those little 112 Latin mottos. And he's put them all through all kinds of strainful calculations. But he arrived at 2012 over and over again. Now, you know, if, if I didn't know that book was written in 1950, I would accuse him of going to just crazy lengths to, to force it to be 2012. But to be honest with you, I just can't figure out why this Belgian Jesuit was trying to land on 2012 other than the fact he must have really believed it. <laughs> Exactly. There was another date that you mentioned that started somewhere in the 7th century that lands on 2012 as well. How did that prophecy work out? Okay. Well, you know, one of the forgotten things in biblical interpretation is all of our Protestant uh, heritage, our reformers like Luther and Calvin and Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon, all these uh, people, they interpreted the book of Revelation with what is called the historicist view. And they believed that the prophecies in the book span from the first advent all the way to the second. So they saw the, the, the bowls and the trumpets and all these judgments as spread out over history. And they thought that the papacy was the Antichrist. And so in Revelation chapter 12, there's a prophecy about a woman being chased into the desert for 1260 days by the red dragon. And so they saw the papacy as Satan's agent. Uh, that he was persecuting the real church, the true church, for 1,260 years. So what they did is they, you know, it depends on where you put the start date. Now, many of them started it in 606 A.D. when the Pope first declared himself to be the universal bishop over everyone. Um, now, others saw it as the time when the papacy acceded to having temporal power when they became a worldly entity. This is when they acquired the papal states, the land around Rome, and they actually did that with a forged document known as the Donation of Constantine. It's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt that this document was complete forgery, and um, Pope Stephen used it to influence King Pepin the Short in France to go to war for him and rout the Lombards out of Italy so it literally slaughtered all these people so that the, the Vatican could gain all this land to become a kingdom. Um, so many interpreters dated that, and, and that period of time was like 752 to 756. 
So you can literally go back and find 19th century commentary on the book of Revelation from very prominent Protestants predicting the end of the papal system in the year 2012 to 2016. And all they did is they took that start date of 752, and they added the 1260 years that the woman was oppressed in the desert by the red dragon. And that just adds up to 2012. Now, some said 752, some say 756. But this is there's, there's over 10 commentaries that I've found um, by very prominent Protestant theologians and, and, and preachers. Yeah, that's really interesting. Now, uh, what uh, kind of contribution did Tom bring to this? Because obviously you've done a lot of the research. What kinds of things did Tom find that kind of complemented the, your work? Well, you know, Tom kind of, he, he's a little more edgy than I am. I, I'm, you know, my, my master's degree is in uh, theology and biblical studies, and so I handled a lot of the, the biblical work. Tom kind of, his, his stuff is more on the occult elements, and which there are quite a few. Uh, and, you know, some of the things that he worked on, I don't know if you ever read his book, Apollyon Rising. But yes, book, it is, yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah, very, very book, much. It sort of dovetails with Apollyon Rising. And, you know, he, he, he wrote quite extensively on things like the, um, the parallel enthronement ceremony of Lucifer that Malachi Martin talked about. Um, you know, Mal- Malachi Martin was a Jesuit priest who, who, who wrote about Satanism being a powerful uh, entity within the Vatican. And he wrote about it very explicitly, and he said the purpose of it was to transform the papacy. Uh, so Tom really covered a lot of that more edgy uh, stuff that goes into the occult realm. Exactly. Now, when, what's the most remarkable thing that we haven't talked about so far in the book? Uh, what does it mean for the average person that's a believer or a non-believer? Let's say they're just a skeptic and they read this book. What's the most important thing that you'd say they should come away when they read the book? Well, you know, for a skeptic, I would say try to explain that religion depopulated prophecy because that that really seems beyond coincidence to me that that, that could fall right in sequence. Um, you know, one of the things that we had talked about, I know we're, we're running short on time, but uh, there's a whole chapter dedicated to the Vatican's aspirations for Jerusalem. Uh, right. You know, it's really it's uncontroversial that the Vatican has always been after Jerusalem. That's what the Crusades were about. Exactly. And it's actually yeah. developments right now. I think you've been talking about them some, where they have been acquiring land, and they're trying to get the United Nations to work as their proxy, and they're actually kind of using the Palestinians yeah. to, to gain sovereignty over the holy sites in the city of Jerusalem. Exactly. In fact, what they want to do, as I heard that they've acquired so much land lately, that uh, they want to declare the city of Jerusalem an international city, so you don't even need a passport, and they actually have got plans where the Vatican is bringing international finance to build an international airport at Atzerat, right beside Bethlehem, and turn it into a tourist trap, and a giant city which will be the alternate capital for the Catholic Church, which is his new Catholic Church in Jerusalem. So besides Rome, they want to basically have a second Rome, in a sense, in Jerusalem, a new capital for the world religious apostasy that they're trying to push forward. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and people can, you can read all the details about this in our book. It's called Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here. It's available at Amazon.com. It's available at Barnes & Noble stores. And like I said at the beginning, if, if you'd like to see some of the documentation for some of the claims that I've been making, we make all that available to you at www.prophecyofthepopes.com. You can get a data DVD with over 20,000 pages of historical documentation that will back up all the claims that I've made. Wow. Prophecyofthepopes.com. And, of course, your own website is uh, Logos called... Logos Apologia. Logos, L-O-G-O-S, Apologia, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A dot O-R-G. We'll have you back on soon and regularly, Chris. So hopefully we'll also get Tom to pop in to give us more of the edgy stuff, too, next time. Back in the moment with our health and wellness uh, hour. You don't want to miss it. Gary Creep, attorney, Obamacare, and the National Defense Authorization Act. Hour three coming up. 